Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast, where each Tuesday, your host, Rick Says, gathers around the mic with outdoor industry entrepreneurs, brand leaders, founders, and enthusiasts to share stories from the backcountry, the startup files, and the retail aisles. Rick's guests offer actionable advice to land your ideal industry gig, grow your outdoor career, or plan your next big adventure. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. And now, here's Rick. Welcome to episode 350 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, brought to you this week by Smug Mug. Today I'm joined by Amy Kopp from Rails to Trails Conservancy. Amy has more than 18 years of experience in print and digital content creation, editorial management, and outdoor journalism. Having joined the RTC team in 2014 as editor of Rails to Trails magazine and the Trail Blog, she focuses on telling the story of the impact of trails on America. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you. So happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be a fun conversation. I've always wondered about Rails to Trails and hiked on a few of the trails, but I'm looking forward to digging in more. Let's start first with how you got into the outdoors. How'd that happen? Oh, so uh, really, I actually feel pretty lucky because my whole childhood was spent in the outdoors. When when I was young, well, my parents would talk to me. They always had this dream they had set of looking out the window and only seeing nature and nobody else's house. And so- Yeah. (laughs) And they were just, they were, my dad was a huge, huge outdoor, outdoor person. And so they bought 24 acres of woods with a Creek in Southwest Pennsylvania, just North of Pittsburgh. And yeah, it was really beautiful. It's still really beautiful. My mom lives there. My dad since passed away, but uh, it was a really great place to grow up. And my three older brothers and I were just constantly outside exploring the land all the time and having, you know, impromptu cookouts, you know, tackling each other in the mud. Yeah, we played in the creek a lot. We hunted for crayfish. Probably shouldn't have done that, but we did a lot of that. So essentially our backyard was just, it was one big park and wildlife area. And, you know, we went to parks and we went to wildlife areas and we went to other places, but it was just really cool to grow up there. And an additional influence was certainly, besides my parents and my family, my grandmother, Dorothy Seif, was a biologist and she had earned, she actually earned multiple degrees in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Yeah. And it wasn't common for women to be in science at that time. And so I really looked up to her. I really looked up to her for that. And a a fun fact, I do have a fun fact that she was lab partners at Chatham University and very close friends with Rachel Carson, who, you know, I think many know as one of the people responsible for the modern environmental movement in the United States. Definitely. Yeah. She wrote the, she wrote one of the seminary books on environmentalism. Yeah. Yeah, Awesome. Wow. That's great. Yes. And I thought, yeah, very cool. And so I heard stories of her growing up and my grandmother took us on a lot of nature walks. And uh, my grandma was just a huge influence. I think she and Rachel Carson were friends up through to the point that Rachel Carson passed away. So um, there was a lot of that. And I do have one other fun story. My my grandmother uh, was a docent at Carnegie Museum for years. And so we would all, uh, our property was very big and we would find dead animals and dead snakes and, um, quite often on the property. As long as they were intact and they weren't, they hadn't started rotting yet. My grandmother would say, put them in the freezer and she would come get them. And so we would put these dead animals in our deep freezer in our garage, along with all the other food. They would just be there in bags. And two of our finds ended up in museum exhibits over wow. the corner. Yeah. Very cool. Did you get to meet Rachel? No. Bummer, uh, yeah. Rachel Carson had passed away by the time my parents uh, adopted me, actually, in the 1970s. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And did you guys also do any camping on the property? I'm sure you had sleepouts, right? You had to. We definitely did quite quite a few sleep outs. We had a field where we would stay. We had friends over and we would camp outside and play things like Bloody Murder around midnight. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's not a PC term. So it was. it's this weird hide and seek game with flashlights. Yeah, I, it was a lot of fun back in the day. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, we didn't have that out west where I grew up. I never heard of that, but I'll bet it was fun. <laughs> And how about journalism? What, who or what inspired you to take that path? So that was a much longer, windy, full circle road. And honestly, when I was young, I just always loved to be creative and write. I, 
I had just a lot of various inspirations. And, you know, even my parents and my brothers, they were all creative. There was a lot of, there was a lot of encouragement to be creative. But, you know, by the time I got to college, I was pretty passionate about a couple things. One was acting. I really wanted to be an actor at the time. Other was journalism. And I really loved the outdoors. But honestly, I was not thinking whenever I was 18, I just didn't think of the outdoors as a career. To me, it was just a part of me. It was a passion. It was something you did. But in my mind, it was not something you got paid for. So, you know, I went into college. You could not actually major in both acting and communications at my school and graduate. And I was under the, you know, this is back when you think you have to graduate in four years or you're, you're, you know, I really wish I could go back and say, just don't even worry about any of that. But so I chose theater and unfortunately, I also let myself be derailed very early on by the naysayers, you know, friends and family members who say there are no jobs in communications. And, uh, you know, one individual even said to me that if I went into journalism, I'd struggle. It would, I wouldn't make any money and I'd end up being forced to eat quote unquote, a lot of spaghetti. (laughs) Nice. Thanks for the encouragement. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And I mean, maybe that's true because I eat a lot of spaghetti. So I, (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, I'm not really. Yeah, that was weird. But so I graduated and ended up, you know, uh, kind of confused. I didn't even. Well, I let myself be derailed by the whole acting thing, too. Eventually, it was just sort of a scary thing to going into it. And since then, I have had several colleagues who have gone into the entertainment industry and they've done great. But I let myself be really um, talked out of that, too. And so. Uh, being this impressionable, somewhat lost person, I graduated and went straight into a master's because uh, my fa- because my father had he had passed away when I was a uh, junior. I want to say I was a junior, or I was I had just become a senior in college. So I just sort of said I need to stay in school. I don't know what's going on with my life. I don't know if that was the right decision or not, but. Well, but you made it. And then, and what was your first job in journalism? I mean, you've had a great career. I mean, it worked out for you. Well, my first job, so... From my perspective, anyway, just sitting here reading your history. (laughs) (laughs) It it didn't... I didn't have to live it. Let's put it that way. You had to live it. (laughs) (laughs) That's, yeah, no, it was a lot of uncertainty back in the day. So I ended up right into a master's with an environmental management focus, which didn't end up being the right part of the outdoors for me, but it sort of propelled me into an internship managing one of the country's first interactive green maps in Pittsburgh. I mean, this is back when you you remember dial-up connections, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) This is back when it was dial up and people were just switching to DSL and cable modems. And so this green map was really bulky. It was hard to use, but it really was a genius way. We all have super Google maps now and all these different mapping apps at the time. It was uh, really intended to be this novel way of promoting outdoor sites, trails, parks, wildlife refuges. And so, and so it just kicked, kickstarted my passion for the outdoors. And then when I moved back to DC, nobody would hire me for writing. There was a lot of things going on. Eventually I moved to DC and no one would hire me and give me a writing job. And I had this passion for the outdoors and for writing because of that internship. Um, so I said, Oh, what do you do when you don't know what you're supposed to do? Well, because my parents were so into school, then they, you know, kept promoting more school. And I said, I should go back and do more school. So I went back again for a communications degree. And at the time ended up getting during the, during this master's program, ended up also getting a part-time job with an organization called the National Recreation and Park Association. Yeah, and it, it's really, really great nonprofit dedicated to local and state parks, recreation, playgrounds. And they had a trade publication called Parks and Recreation Magazine. And I didn't initially end up working for them until, so I went to Philly for four years and ended up doing public relations after I got my communications degree. I ended up loathing it. I Public relations, is, it's a really, I respect those individuals who can successfully do PR. There are brilliant people around the country that can do it. I have a lot of heroes who are very good at it. But yeah, I, it's pretty tough. 
it, it's really tough. It's really tough. And it's, it, you know, you send out, you do all this work, maybe it's a 12% reward. Or, right, you know. right, right. So when I moved back to D.C. the second time, luckily, the National Recreation and Park Association actually had an opening for a communications person. So I would still have had to do some PR. But this opening was for Parks and Recreation magazine. Oh, cool. And Yes. So I could kind of do both. And so I went in and I just begged for them to hire me. And that was my first real job in journalism, I would say. And definitely very impressionable. Yeah, that's a good place to start. I mean, that, that was a good magazine back then. I think I had a subscription to that magazine, actually. I went to college for, I have two degrees in outdoor recreation. And my listeners have heard me tell the story, same kind of thing. When I was told my family I was switching to outdoor recreation, I thought I was going to be kicked out of the family. So <laughs> not a lot of encouragement there either. <laughs> but good that you stuck to your guns. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah, they, I think at the time they were just really happy that I sort of had found a direction and Parks and Rec magazine, uh, that was, I got the job there during a time period when the show Parks and Recreation was just really starting to take off. So that sort of sweetened the deal for people who had no idea, you know, what the National Recreation and Park Association was. You know, you could say, well, I help write for Parks and Recreation and they're like, oh, the show. Yeah, right, right. You know, and it's like, yeah, yeah sure, this has nothing to do with us, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to say, you've had a long, successful career with a collection of high-profile outdoor and education-based nonprofits that probably was, I guess, started through some of that experience of parks and recreation, right? I mean, that probably lined you up to head down that path. I think, yes, it did. It the job at Parks and Recreation also gave me confidence to start really seeking other, you know, mission-based nonprofits, but from that writing and from that trade publication magazine writing sphere. But also, you know, what it ended up really doing initially was uh, giving me a lot of passion about writing, you know, because I was starting to learn about how important outdoor assets were as economic drivers and social drivers. And you take people take parks and trails and playgrounds for granted sometimes, but the truth is they are in many ways so vital for the health and safety of communities. And I started to realize how passionate that I felt about these assets. And so I also realized that I just love writing. And so I kind of took I could, took several years to be a freelance writer. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. I think it takes everybody a few years to get started in freelance. Freelance anything is tough. It's yeah. It's really tough. And I. Wanted to try that first. So uh, I ended up after after working for Parks and Rec magazine and, and RPA for a while, just going and doing some freelancing. And I ended up working with various nonprofit organizations and a lot of other education-based organizations. And so that was a great experience for me too. And as an editor, I really value understanding what it's like to be a freelancer because I think it's really helped in my interactions with freelancers and it's helped in my understanding of how workflows actually are implemented and what freelancers need to be successful. Yeah, because you saw the whole process from freelance to someone who works directly for the magazine to now editor. I mean, that, that helps got to help you a ton. Yeah. You have some empathy for those poor freelancers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Did you ever work outdoor retail? I have not. Okay. Uh, I will say I have had several retail jobs, hmm. at least at least three when I was younger, and it is not an area where I thrive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another weird thing, too. Retail is tricky as well, yeah. No, no matter how much you love what you're selling, it's just retail. I mean, what can you say? It is, it, yes, it is. It comes with a lot of its own challenges. I do have favorite retail brands, but I leave retail to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm glad I'm out of it now. So you're also involved with OWAA as second vice president of OWAA. What's that, what does that entail? What's that job like? Yeah, that's OWAA is, it's a really incredible organization of about 600 outdoor writers and communicators. I know that you are also uh, very involved with OWAA. Mm -hmm. and, and so being the second vice president, I really am there as a guiding hand for the organization, I started with OWAA several years ago, becoming more active as a committee member on the DEIA committee, which I now co-chair, and also the 
conference committee. And so we started getting to know the organization there. But now I think my job as the second VP um, is really about learning and learning how I can ultimately serve the organization under our, uh, our current president right now, Katie McAuliffe, our first v- VP, Ken Keffer. And I think I'm just learning how to how to serve in those capacities and eventually we'll be helping to plan the annual conference and, you know, make sure that the OWAA experience is great and enriching for our attendees and our members. And I've definitely found that it's been for me. So it's a great group. It's, it is a great group. It's great for me too. I didn't know anything about it. And Chez kind of exposed me to that and got me to join. And I, it's been great. I mean, I've been to two conferences now and interact with a bunch of folks you know, away from the conference. I haven't participated or joined any groups or anything yet. I'm sure that's coming. But yeah, it's been super tremendous just for connections and support. And because I'm, I'm new to this whole media thing. I was, my whole career is about sales and I was a guide and, you know, I was in the outdoor sales side of things. So I was selling to all the retailers traveling around the world. I was a rep for a while. So even though I interacted with media and some of those folks, I didn't know how to be a writer. I was always a photographer. But now that I'm doing the podcast thing, on this side of the media fence, it's a completely different animal. So OWA has helped me a ton. It's great. Yeah, I can definitely see that, you know, being able to just be in one room with so many different diverse voices in the industry would be really kind of incredible. (laughs) Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And it's a diverse range of voices and also a diverse generation of voices because we have some great folks that have been doing this for many years and then a bunch of new folks coming up so yeah it's awesome i love it yeah yeah that's it's a great variety of experience and uh age and focus yeah uh, yeah, yeah it's incredible group yeah so back to rails to trails tell us about rails to trails what is the mission there so rails to trails conservancy is the largest advocacy organization dedicated to trails walking and biking in the country um We're ultimately dedicated to connecting the nation by trail, and it's written in our mission to ensure that everyone has safe places to walk, bike, and be active in the outdoors. And that is something that that is something that's a very critical part of our mission, social equity, access to safe walking and biking infrastructure, all of those things. So we were founded in 1986, and when we were initially founded, there was a focus really on the on on the build out of rail trails across the country and supporting local advocates on the ground who wanted to create rail trails in their neck of the woods. But over, you know, 35, 40 years, there's been a big evolution now where it's about connected trail systems and connecting biking infrastructure and just ensuring that uh, from community to community, from region to region, there's equitable access to trails and walking and biking routes for everyone, regardless of, you know, age, ability, and with a focus definitely on underserved communities. And all over the country. I mean, it's from inner cities to rural areas too, correct? Yes, that's correct. We we really have a focus to really make sure that all Americans have access to this type of infrastructure. Yeah, I think it was, I graduated with my outdoor rec degree in 1980. 889 I forget but it seems like it was just getting started back then and I was real excited about it I, I didn't participate in any of them but it's great that you guys are doing this fantastic work and these trails are in every state now I'm assuming That is correct there are more than 40,000 miles of known trails that we've cataloged in our in our database and via trail link but we also have within that about 25,000 miles of rail trails specifically. And we know that there's about 9,000, eight or 9,000 more that are in development currently or waiting to be built. Wow, that's awesome. And with that 9,000 then, is that all that's left or are there other things that you haven't even started looking at yet? No, there's, there, I think that there's always disused rail, railroads popping up. There are communities all over the country that have expressed an interest in the right of way that they maybe sort of go fallow or go unused for quite a long time. So there's definitely a lot of potential for, you know, even more and more trail development. And it's really, it's kind of something that starts in the community and is led by the community. And Rails to Trails Conservancy really just tries to provide that the federal advocacy to get 
billions of dollars in funding and dedicated funding to help, uh, you know, help provide support for these projects as they're being developed and support for the communities as they look to develop their trails. We also do get involved in some leadership of trail network development through our Trail Nation program. We have about eight regional slash local projects going on right now for which we're directly partnering and involved. And of course, we have the 3,700 mile Great American Rail Trail, which is in progress. It'll be from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. I shouldn't say that. It'll travel between Washington, D.C. and Mm -hmm. Washington State. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on right now. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So I bet there's all these projects going on. You probably don't grab a pick or a shovel very often. How do you get the word out about all the stuff going on? You, have a, you must have a newsletter and all kinds of, you have a great website. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's definitely where I come in. I do collaborate with an, an incredible, incredible group of people. Our trail development department is, you know, just, they're a true inspiration to me. All the on the ground coordination and the efforts that, that they really put into seeing these projects through. But my job as an editor and the, editorial director is essentially to tell the story. And so my editorial team and I work constantly seeking ways to elevate the voices of the people who are on the ground, who are making these projects happen and, you know, who are sacrificing a lot and or really, in some cases, fighting, you know, fighting for the funding and really fighting for the support that they need to get these projects done. So yeah, we certainly, we do a lot of destination writing, but you know, we really focus on elevating the voices of the communities and the leadership and the people who are really making the trails happen. And we really also look to elevate what makes these assets so impactful. So we want to tell the story, you know, article, blog, um, uh, social media. We're always looking for new venues and new ways to tell the impact related to things like health and active transportation and the environment and small business development and, you know, interview the people on the ground who can come out and say, my business, I started with, with 10 bikes and now I rent a fleet of 200 bikes and my business has gone up 500% because of the trail and because of the trail users. So, yeah. When the beauty of the trails is everybody can go on them there, you know, I mean, you don't have to be a level, certain fitness level. You don't have to be into cycling or hiking. You can just go for a walk in the afternoon down one of these old trail paths. It's awesome. Yeah, that's what I love about it. They're really for everyone and they provide safe access for everyone. And, you know, you don't have to have any kind of specific level. I am not a, an adventure bicyclist. I work with a lot of really amazing long distance bicyclists who are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I am not one of those. You'll see me out on the trail running five miles, three miles, or just taking a walk and just enjoy that's where you're going to see me do that. And I think that everyone, you know, in their own way can find something, can find their way on trails, find their little, as my one colleague says, she wrote a little story for us in the next issue of the magazine. And she said, it's about finding your own little set of peace, you know, your own, cool. uh, you know, the, your thing that makes that experience special to you. And it's very personal to every person. We're going to take a little break and give some love to our sponsor. I've heard from some of you photographers out there that you've always wanted to sell your photos online. Well, Smug Mug makes it easy. With a few clicks, you can start selling prints and digital downloads right away. They handle everything from billing to shipping and work with some of the best labs in the world. Rick Say's Photography has been with Smug Mug for over 20 years, and they've handled every transaction flawlessly. Go to the outdoorbizpodcast.com slash sell photos and try it for free. To set up your account today, go to the outdoorbizpodcast.com slash sell photos. And now, back to the show. Yeah, so I'm curious about the guidebooks, too. Do you share some of those stories in those guidebooks? I'm sure there's some amazing stories of how, uh, you know, from the trail getting rediscovered, maybe if, like, if like you say, it went fallow and somebody found it and resurrected it. There's got to be some pretty cool stories. Yeah, so the guidebooks are actually a really cool project that we do, and they're kind of something that I think that the staff really loves it, but they're also very popular with our national trail audience because we do like to tell those little stories within the guidebook, but ultimately it's a tool that we can provide for trail users too, to go out and know what to expect along a route and 
kind of know where the waypoints are, restrooms, trailheads, how to get to certain trailheads, what you might expect, and what issues too, because these guides really are intended to serve every single person, you know, regardless of ability. So they can also be really useful if you have a mobility issue or if you have, um, you know, uh, like a disability that might impact how you can get on the trail and how you access certain facilities. We really try and make the guidebook useful for, for everyone who wants to get on. So it's really cool though. The staff gets together and we form teams and each year and everyone goes out in these small groups to update all the new things that have happened on these routes. So we pick a region of the country every single year and that's what we focus on. And, you know, trails change so much in five years, they might get 10 new miles on them or one new mile plus five new restrooms plus, you know, a new pavilion or a new connection to an incredible geographic or sorry, geological site. So yeah, it's really about keeping these books updated. We cover regions all over the country and the staff loves it. And it's also a really great reminder too, when you're out there of, of, you know, why we're doing this work in the first place. That's what I was thinking. It's got to be helpful just for you to find the path and walk the path, but there's got to be little tidbits of information that that talk about how the trail came to be and what used to be there and the people that came before you. I just love that kind of stuff. It's got to be super interesting. Yeah, definitely. The history of it and what makes communities so unique or so incredible. And the guidebooks tell that story and that being out there and really assessing those trails, you get to experience so many different diverse communities and trails and experiences that way. And it's, it's, I think for a lot of staff, it's their favorite, it's their favorite, you know, little, uh, staff perk, I think. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine getting out there and experiencing the whole, all the work you've been talking about. What's the editorial work like? Do you write a lot of articles for magazines, newspapers, that kind of thing? Uh, in terms of, you mean in terms of my job specifically? Yeah. We have a really awesome team, I would say, of communicators. I have um, an editorial team, and we focus on telling the stories of these trails through Rails to Trails magazine, our trail blog, the guidebooks, social media. We focus on creating our own editorial content and putting it out to our national audience. Our communications team they are super, super focused on telling these stories and elevating these stories, but through other national channels. So uh, they work with quite a few national, local outlets of all kinds to try and really draw attention to these projects. Yes, I'm certainly. But our editorial team, what, you know, we're really kind of, what we really kind of try and focus on, I would say is, again, finding what, finding the standout stories, the really unique things that are happening, the trails that are kind of pushing the dial. And we identify those stories and we elevate them. We elevate them through, you know, our vehicles, which do go out to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people each month. So our focus, yeah. Got to be a bunch of great stories too. How do you choose? (laughs) (laughs) It is really incredible. There is always a new awesome story to be told. Yeah, we just really try and focus. There's kind of a blend of the things that we know that are happening in trail network projects that really could use, I think, some exposure and really could be elevated to a larger audience. And then sometimes you just find that really cool story. We have to make sure. So with the magazine, what we really try and do is make sure that we get a good geographic coverage. That makes sense. And it's yeah, but it's diff- it's difficult. We have three print issues and one digital, all digital issue that's really more of a multimedia issue. And when you're dealing with, you know, 50 states plus D.C. plus Puerto Rico, uh, it's really it can be a huge challenge to try and make sure that you're really covering all the incredible stories out there. But we just, you know, we just keep churning and churning away. And there's a lot of prioritization, I'll bet. And, you know, that's uh, that's awesome. That's got to be tough. Yeah, it's very challenging, but, you know, I think is so I've been, I have been with Rails to Trails Conservancy for almost nine years now, and my senior editor, Laura Stark, who is basically, I would say my right hand, but 
she is a force to be reckoned with and she she is just such a creative creative force i would say cool you know she's been there for i think 11 i want to say 11 years uh maybe 12 and you know we just keep at it yeah exactly (laughs) you have to i mean there's so much and you have so much content i mean it's probably never ending in input of content it is never ending what helps is our trail blog which is it is uh with a national focus as well it does provide us a lot more flexibility and so we like to tell a lot of stories a lot of digital stories that way and you know my uh, vice president of communications brandy i wanted to shout her out just because she is just such such a guiding i would say a guiding voice that that the stuff that she has in her head and the way that she can just take all of the priorities of, you know, Rails to Trails Conservancy's national audience, and she can just sort of do these calculations in her head and she can say, all right, let's prioritize this for this week. Let's prioritize this for next week. So, you know, I definitely don't work in a bubble. I have great people around me that I would say are, you know, really make that place go the whole communications team is constantly making that place go it's just it is uh it is a big team effort and you know it's helpful that we have so many really committed colleagues across the country you know in various not various regional offices at rails to trails conservancy to that can really provide some expertise and a guiding voice there as well so that's awesome uh, how many offices do you have right across the country give or take you know, I've never counted them. Seven, I want to say there's, we have a national office and then we have maybe about one, two, three, four, five, six regional offices. Gotcha. We also do have staff that just sort of kind of take satellite offices in, in different states right, throughout right. the country too. So Rails to Trails Conservancy is pretty, pretty spread out and pretty well placed in terms of strategic geographic focus. Yeah, I would think you'd have to be. Yeah, yeah. What part of the work do you enjoy the most? What do I enjoy the most? That's a great question. There are two things for me, I think. One is really being able to go out on the trails, and especially ones that I have not experienced before uh, for a mapping trip or a special event. And to be able to walk and ride these assets or hang out with the legends and the champions who made them possible. For example, sometimes I have the opportunity to go out and help with our Hall of Fame trail events or you know, I'm just with several staff members and we're riding a trail that, you know, we've never been before or on a trail we've never been on before. And then you get a true sense of the surrounding communities. But for the first time, you know, there's that kind of first time experience that you get on a trail that you haven't been before. And the first time kind of amazingness that hits you right. and the real of how all the things along that trail and the communities and the neighborhoods impact that trail and vice versa, because, Each trail is so unique in their spirit and the experiences that they help invoke and the experiences you have. And uh, they're driven by these communities that create and maintain them. So that's definitely something I really love about my job. And the others are going to sound a little bit more dry, but frankly, I just love doing interviews. (laughs) That makes sense. I do too. (laughs) (laughs) It's, you know, I always go into an interview with like a little trepidation and I almost always walk. I don't know how you feel, but when I go in, sometimes I'm nervous or sometimes I just want to make sure that I'm going to ask the right questions or that if it's somebody who is very prominent, that I'm respectful and that they like me. But then I walk out of that interview forgetting all of that usually because almost always. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, And have kind of this renewed sense of why I got into the field to begin with. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think interviewing, its it, there's an art to it, but I think it's, you know, the thing that I always re- remember is they put their shoes on the same way you do. So you just go in there and start asking the questions. But the questions, I go, I try to prepare a little bit, and but it always gets, it begs other questions and other questions beg other questions. And then next thing you know, you walk out of there, you just learn so much, way more than I always learn way more than I thought I was going to going in. So that's what I love about it. And people are so generous with their time. So it's just a great way to learn, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I've learned so much, so much. Yeah. It's opened up five, five times, 500 times over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit. I read that you also enjoy great soccer. Did you play soccer in school or in growing up? I did. I played soccer as a youngster and in high school. 
full disclosure, I wasn't the greatest. I am just a big fan of the sport, uh, particularly internationally and also domestically. So kind of a, I'm just a fan who enjoys catching a game on a couch or a bar seat every now and again, or, you know, when I can, when it's possible in the stadium, of course. Gotcha. So, are, are you a soccer fan? Am I a soccer fan? A little bit. I like the World Cup stuff and the Olympics, I think. I was, I'm was. i a huge Olympics fan, so obviously that. And I, for ah. some reason, I gravitate towards soccer. My grandfather played semi-pro soccer back in Ohio when he first came to this country as a young boy from Spain. And he loved soccer. We watched it all the time. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, pretty cool. I have this. I still have this. The, his team in Canton, Ohio, and there's a this. It's an old photo, but it's all the guys. You know, their headshots around this big soccer ball, and yeah, it's pretty cool. He loved it. It's a great sport. It's an incredible sport. It's really fun to watch. There's so much international relevance to the game. You know, it's not for everyone, but it is such a relevant sport to so much that happens overseas frankly. And I also just really like the sport itself. Like I said, I wasn't the greatest playing soccer, but um, I I really like to watch the game and the strategy, you know, how it plays out and everything. So yeah, I'm a huge fan. And you know, if I can watch it with a glass of wine, even better. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I watched a lot with my grandfather and I'm He's probably bummed I never really played it. I never, I took the American football. And in hindsight, I probably, he wanted to teach me how to be a kicker, how to kick the ball. And in hindsight, <laughs> I probably should have done that because I never, you know, out of high school, I stopped growing. I probably could have been a better kicker than trying to play ball, regular ball. But no, it was fun playing with him and fun watching with him. And it was great. He loved it. Very cool. What are Very some cool. of your other out, outdoor activities? Uh, oh, gosh. You know, Besides, of course, getting out and running on my local rail trails, which I do often. I really love hiking. That, that's something that just stems from my childhood. And uh, I'm, I live very close within walking distance to a lake. So I take my kayak out for a spin on the lake whenever I can, whenever I get the opportunity, when I'm not, you know, hunched over my desk writing <laughs> away. Or, right. And can I say, can we call cooking out on a campfire an outdoor activity? Sure. Yeah. Why not? That maybe is one of my absolute favorite activities because it you involve so many other people. It you know it's not exclusionary in that you, you can always find something for everyone. It's a great way to to kick back and get to know people and or just socialize or relax. And if it involves food too, I'm a really easy sell. Yeah. So same, yeah. so cooking out on an actual campfire or on a grill. Uh, both. Okay. I love camp- cooking. Yes, and mm. I love I love grilling too. So are you a, are you a Dutch oven? I am not per se. My friend gets into that, and my husband is pretty good at it. So I, you know, growing up and growing up in uh, Southwest Pennsylvania, when we would cook out and we would just start, you know, we had the little makeshift fire pit in our backyard. We would just foil things up. We right. would take any potatoes, vegetables, hamburger meats, anything we could, you know, get permission from our parents to to release to us to make a big mess out of, and we would just put some oil in there or a salt and pepper and just roll it up into a, uh, you know, a little foiled container. And oh yeah. Those foil it. pouches were great. Stick them in the coals. It was awesome. Yeah. Were you a, uh, in the scout? It was a brownie. I was never a girl scout. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cause a lot of us learned all that stuff in scouts. Yeah. Very cool. We used to do, I remember some folks putting all that stuff in the foil too. On some of these long drives, we would go drive from, you know, I lived in Southern California. We drive up to Yosemite. We put the foil pouch on the engine of the car, engine block, and drive for <laughs> about an hour and a half and pull it out and eat it. That was another trick somebody showed me. That's uh, awesome. Does that work? Does that yeah, it works. Work? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it works. As long as you have heat. <laughs> doesn't matter where the heat comes from. You just need heat. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try that sometime. Do you have any suggestions or advice for folks wanting to get into the outdoor biz? Either... Working for nonprofits, groups like yours, any advice there? Media, OWA has some great resources. Yeah, sure. You know, I actually, I do have advice for what it's worth for the individuals who really want to get into writing, freelance writing, or just paid writing. And I would have to say, because of my experiences, I just really want to encourage those who really love it and want to get into it 
Don't be deterred by the naysayers or the people who tell you that you're not good enough or you're not experienced enough or they're not going to want you or they don't want you or the no's. Don't be deterred by hearing the word no. I once had an editor tell me he wasn't interested in hiring me to write for their publication. And this is a big trade publication for a pretty big national nonprofit. And I was told that he would never hire me to write because they only hired quote unquote real. I think the word was reputable writers or real writers. (laughs) What the hell does that mean? Yeah, something to that effect. And honestly, I've been told I, there was a publication that I was explaining to another writer. I really wanted to get involved in at some point or, and I was also told too that, well, they only hire big writers. Amy, they only hire big names. I don't know. Maybe, you know, there are public. That's sad. That's interesting. That's, I haven't heard that before. That's too bad. Yeah. There, you know, there there are publications that I think probably do feel that way. And I, you know, you just can't let those, that noise, you can't let that noise get you down. So I definitely would encourage all those writers out there. Don't listen to that because, you know, I'm an editor of a trade publication. I actually, and an I'm an editorial director. I get paid full time to to write and edit stories about the outdoor world. And I am definitely not a big star journalist, but I definitely think it's a privilege. I find it to be a very real privilege to to do what I do and to be able to do this every day and for an industry I love. And there are many different roads. There are many different roads you can take and People are going to tell you every single day that there's no way that you're going to do that. And I did listen. I listened to those voices back in my 20s. It derailed me for many years. And I think that if I hadn't listened and if I had, you know, a little bit more confidence in myself or at least or if I just said, I don't care what they say, I have no confidence, but I'm still going to do this anyway. You know, I might have been here faster, but it doesn't matter. You take the roads you take. Uh, Yeah, I would say that I just think people need to stop deterring people from their dreams. But if you find people that are deterring you from your dreams, don't just block that out. Yeah. Stick with that. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. Maybe because I come from a long line of stubborn folks, we just stick to it no matter what till the <laughs> ends of the earth. But yeah, I, you know, don't you keep doing, do what you want, do what you love. Don't let anybody tell you different. Go for it. Absolutely. That's great advice. Yeah. What's your favorite outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? Ah, under a hundred dollars. Uh, honestly, my tennis shoes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. Under a hundred dollars. That's hard to do these days. Yeah. I, the running shoes I have for trail running, you know, on rail trails, they're under a hundred dollars. And for me, that's be, uh, besides clothing, of course, for me, that's all <laughs> I really, you know, to get out on the trail and, and do what I love. And so from, you know, running, walking, reflecting outside, I just throw my tennis shoes on and I get out there. That's a good one. What brand are they? You know what? I can actually, can I hold, can I go look? Yeah, I don't go even, for it. Go I look, yeah. Aha, uh-huh. yeah. Because honestly, I don't even, th- I do focus a little bit on the brand. These are, I have Ripus. Okay. And they also are great because in addition to running, they're really good too for things like kickboxing and for swiveling. You know, they have a little bit of a natural swivel on the bottom. And so they're great for mobility. And yeah, I really like them. And I know that there's a lot of really great equipment out there. And I'm sort of equipment illiterate, to be honest, when it comes to. (laughs) But yeah, my tennis shoes. All right, good. That's a good one. Yeah, I like that. I was just, I don't think, gosh, I can't remember the last time I bought a pair of shoes for under a hundred bucks, but it's good that you can still find them. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How about some of your favorite books? What are some of your favorite books, outdoor books? You know, I actually, I have to admit that I often don't have time to catch up on the latest outdoor writing because I am usually in front of a computer between, I would say, eight, eight and 14 hours a day. So whenever I'm kind of done for the day, I, I steer more towards, I steer more towards modern lit. Okay. Yeah. I like, I really like Salinger, uh, I'm trying to tackle some more F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I would say my favorite book, though, is, and it's not an outdoor book, it's just, it's called The Secret History by Donna Tart. Oh, cool. I haven't heard of that. It's really cool. She was considered, she's kind of considered affiliated with the literary Brad Pack, but um, it's a book that, it's a book about a kid in college who finds his way in college 
but it really changed my perspective on things and kind of how I was in college and and Donna Tart apparently she was a real go-getter in college too the writer and you know I was sort of lost in college and so the people that can really go and have a real focus and be true to themselves when they're that young I'm very inspired by that <laughs> yeah me too I flucked out the first time I had to go to a junior college to get my grades up so I can relate to that <laughs> Yeah, college comes with all sorts of static. Oh, yeah. Well, you're so young and, you know, it's a pretty, <laughs> yes. pretty diff- unique time in your life. As we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say or ask of our listeners? No, just, you know, keep loving the outdoors, right? right Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well said. Yeah. And if people would like to follow up, where can they find you? What's the best way? LinkedIn or? So, yes, I am shamefully bad at keeping my Twitter uh, updated. But they can find me on LinkedIn. I think it's I think it's just LinkedIn slash IN slash Amy Cop. Okay, cool. We'll find that. We'll find that and link to that in the show notes. Well, Amy, it's been great talking to you. I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, LWA conference, and uh, we'll share this all around and get you lots of listens. Yes, thank you. Likewise, this was really fun, and thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, uh, talk with you and share some stuff with your audience. Cool. Thanks. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theoutdoorbizpodcast.com, where you'll find show notes with links to everything we talked about and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or spread the word and tell a friend about the show. That would really help us out, too. Be sure to tune in every week. And thanks again for listening to the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Rick Sayes.